Amen, indeed. It's kind of comforting to be able to sing those words, I am yours, and know that it's the truth, that each and every one of us belongs to God. We're all brothers and sisters in faith. I forgot how to play the palm cross. Let's hope I didn't forget how to play the violin. <laughs> when I was in high school, I wasn't one of the cool kids. I was an orchestra nerd. I spent a lot of time in the practice room. That was a long time ago, though. Don't thank me, thank God. Thank God. There was a day and a time when this little orchestra nerd would have just had a panic attack at having to play a solo in front of people. I was fine playing in an orchestra or in a, an ensemble, but put me alone and my heart froze and my hands would turn to ice. Spent a lot of hours practicing the violin. Yeah, I was an orchestra nerd. I didn't come from a wealthy family. We didn't belong to the country club. And I never felt quite good enough to fit in with the popular kids at school. With all that time I spent in the practice room, I wasn't tuned in to the cool trends of clothing or what the newest tunes were. I listened to Bach and Mozart. I gave up trying to be accepted by the cool kids at school and had a different circle of friends, my musician friends and my church friends. We all want to be accepted and loved by our peers and ultimately by God. Sometimes we find ourselves born into the right circumstance and we fall into that cool crowd, the popular ones, automatically. Other times we have to try really hard we dress a certain way, we drive the right car, we live on the right side of town, we hang out with all the right people. We spend a good deal of energy trying to be good enough to be one of them. As we grow up, we try to use that familiar method for being good enough for God. We try to follow all the right rules, dress the part, serve on all the right committees, and still we can find ourselves filled with doubt and the temptation to be jealous of the one who seems to have it all together. She is just so at peace. Her soul is right. Her faith seems so strong. Well, ours seems to come and go as we struggle with the big questions. You know, the, the big questions. Those big questions that you're writing on this list because when you die, you're going to go up to heaven and you're going to say, God, why? And you've got this whole list. We can try as hard as we want to will ourselves to perfection, to, to work hard enough, to look right, to earn our salvation. But we're left with this feeling of never having quite arrived. So... What does it take? Let's look at Jesus' path. 
we know that Jesus came from a, a small town and he grew up son of a carpenter that was not a prestigious occupation back then but he'd come a long way and he had been teaching and healing for going on three years now word had spread and everybody thought yes this is Jesus he's the one when they'd come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them go into the village ahead of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her untie them and bring them to me if anyone says anything to you just say this the Lord needs them and he will send them immediately this took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet saying tell the daughter of Zion look your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt the foal of a donkey the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them they brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them and he sat on them a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees palm trees and spread them on the road the crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting Hosanna to the son of David blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord Hosanna in the highest heaven when he entered Jerusalem the whole city was in turmoil asking who is this the crowds were saying this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee so they saw him coming they were adulating him using one of those big words Jesus was quite the celebrity that day he was treated like royalty the palm waving of the palms and the, the laying them out that was a symbol of what they did for royalty when royalty came by the palm branches were a direct symbol of the people calling Jesus the king that's what made the authorities really nervous so he was being treated like royalty coming down the Mount of Olives riding on that donkey fulfilling prophecy with people waving the palm branches shouting hosannas and words of adoration you and I might have been liable to let that go to our heads a little bit yeah but not Jesus he didn't he put God's will at the center of his life not letting all that attention and adoration distract him from his mission of serving God's purpose with his earthly life in Philippians open back up here Philippians chapter 2 starting at verse 5 this is what they wrote about that whole thing and what we're supposed to do let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited but he emptied himself taking the form of a slave being born in human likeness and being found in human form he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus at that name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father we mustn't forget that last part to the glory of God the Father Jesus didn't let his popularity with the world become his master he stayed on track emptying himself for the sake of the underdogs in society for the poor the homeless the sick the outcast the sinners the brokenhearted Jesus taught us to put us to put the Creator and the giver of life at the center of our lives never letting the approval of the crowd sway us from seeking first the kingdom of God he modeled for us what it looks like to seek the kingdom 
to seek to know and love and serve God with your whole life, not just one little part of your life. His message was not that we should try harder, keep trying, trying, trying until you get it right, but to surrender our own will so that God could do in us what we could not do on our own. Surrender our will to God so that God could do in us what we could not do on our own. This is the beginning of Holy Week. The week we remember Jesus' last supper with his disciples, his gut-wrenching prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane, his arrest and brutal treatment that resulted in crucifixion. This week is the week that scares some of us. It scares us because we think if God made his own son go through that, all of that, what is God going to do to me? What is God going to do to me? The question should not be what is God going to do to us, but rather what are we already enduring that God can transform and bring us into new life in Christ Jesus. We are Easter people. Christians believe in Easter. We celebrate Jesus' resurrection. And next week on Easter, that's the holiest day of our year. Now, a lot of people like Christmas. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. We get presents. Some people get presents on Easter, but if it weren't for Easter, we wouldn't even remember Christmas. If it weren't for what Jesus did and for the resurrection, there would be no Christianity. But the fact that there is, that we are still here celebrating our risen Lord, remembering all that he endured for our sakes, I think is proof that it's all true. Proof in the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. The question is, do we believe that resurrection and transformation is possible for our lives? Can we live in such a way with complete surrender to the will of God, relying on the mercy of God, and learn to live by the leading of that Holy Spirit of God? What would that look like? When we follow the way of Jesus, we will find ourselves living in community rather than in perpetual competition. In community rather than competition. We will truly seek the good of the other person rather than trying to always gain advantage over the other. We will connect with small groups of people, of faithful people who trust each other who pray for one another and know that there will always be somebody there for us when we are going through that darkest hour. And we all have those darkest hours. We have them. Some are going through it right this minute. Others have been through it and come out the other end. And it makes us realize that God was with us through it all. He never let us down. In these small groups, we'll have friends who love us despite the fact that we just don't have it all together. We have nothing to hold back with these people because they love us just the way we are. We don't have to put on airs and act all perfect because they know us. (laughs) they'll know they'll know we're putting on an act and there will be no requirement to think that we all have to look exactly alike or think alike even or dress alike or even live the same standard of living we're all brothers and sisters in Christ we're accepted for who we are drawn together by the love of God to me That's the perfect church. The perfect church. In other words, we will be Christ to one another. 
living out the legacy of love that Jesus showed to us. God's love will fill us to overflowing, and those around us will experience the kind of love that we know and experience from God. Grace will inform our lives. God's grace. God's grace will be our mantra, influencing our ability to forgive and to move on into healed relationships. You know that Tom and I are great movie buffs. Um, we completed watching all of the Academy Award nominated films the other day by watching August Osage County. Rented it at home. Meryl Streep, by the way, does a masterful job. She totally deserved that award. She played Violet, Violet, the mother in the family. But at the end of this movie, I found myself wondering, what if, what if, how different all of those lives might have turned out if the characters of Violet and Beverly, wife and husband, had been able to talk about the betrayal early on in their marriage and forgive one another rather than resorting to covering up their pain with drugs and alcohol all the rest of their years. I won't tell you any more than that. It's a good movie. It's kind of depressing. But when you think about it, wow, what if? There's a what if in a lot of our lives. How differently things might have turned out but we can't dwell there, we can't go backwards. We can only go forwards. So we call on the grace of God to transform our lives and to, to help us to live into the future embodying the kind of love and grace that Christ embodied for us. God's grace is what allows us to be forgiven and whole. God's grace is what saves us and makes us new. The way of Jesus is paved with grace. May you feel the love and grace of God at work in you. And may you respond at a whole new level. Something that you've never really dared to do before. So that nothing stands in your way of feeling set free to a new life in Christ. It's going to be an awesome week, folks. Praise God. Amen.